All right, it is January 8th, 2020, and we have our first podcast guest, which is our new ranger, Jeremy Sorensen. Pleasure to meet you. Jeremy, you've been in town about a month now? About a month, yes, sir. Here in between Benton and Delano. That's how you pronounce it? Delano. That's how the locals pronounce it. Just got married, correct? I did on the 26th of last month out in Oklahoma. All right. (laughs) So Jeremy's our newest ranger, and we just wanted to take a minute and have a conversation with him and see what brought him to Tennessee, what brought him to Hawassi Okoe specifically, and just learn a little bit about his life. So what was it that attracted you about the Hawassi Okoe area? I think the recreation portion, um, you're right next to the Appalachian Mountains, you're in southern Tennessee, so it's a mild climate. Um, I have poor rock climbing skills, and so that's something that the park here has to offer where I can definitely grow. I'm a Florida boy, and so as Florida boys, we don't have rapids. We have just long rivers with gators in them. And so the idea of really learning the skill set of maneuvering around whitewater sounds incredibly inviting. And so the recreational opportunities, um, when I'm looking at the area geographically, it offers so much. But also the area, um, always try thinking about where I'm going to go and ask myself, how can I add value to it? And so hopefully me being here will help the economy grow. Um, but the housing is affordable. Um, land's very affordable. There's just a lot of things that will be really conducive for me as a single guy, as a married man, and as, also as a father. And so that's a lot of things are really inviting um, about this area of the nation. One of the special things about this uh, podcast is uh, this is Jeremy's first month. And so I want to do this podcast again in a year from now just to see what the differences are and what he thinks the career is going to be, what he thinks his year is going to be like. So I really that's kind of one of the things we wanted to get into as well. So what, what, do you, what are your first like thoughts on this area, your first real impressions? Impressions on just... The community at large, or what do you mean, sir? Just everything in general. Like, I remember getting the uniform, and we joked around about this, about how I got in trouble for wearing it too much because I was just like, this is like this lifelong quest. This is, you know, and just, I was so exciting, so yes. excited, and I couldn't wait to get here. And so um, I just want to see what you're feeling right now, what you're, what you're thinking, what you're just, an overall just like general... Um, to answer that question, Angelo, it's, I feel like I'm at a dream state, at a honeymoon state, if you will, where nothing seems real. Um, I'm like, oh man, I'm at this amazing place and I've been given this opportunity, I've been granted this. Um, a lot of times in my life, I feel like you've had to earn a lot of things um, before it was just given to you. And I think maybe as a, a pre-ranger or as a summer ranger with the Corps Engineers, like I've done some things to kind of earn it, um, but as a ranger sitting in front of you right now, I feel like uh, a lot of responsibility to earn it day in and day out and the sort of sacrifices that I'll have to make and commitment. Um, I'm aware of those things and I take a lot of pride and honor in it, but uh, very humbled to answer your question. And um, often it, it feels like it's not reality just because it's, it's a dream come true. I felt, I felt the same way. You're, you're a veteran like I am. And mm-hmm. so a lot of the times you get that uniform, you've put in a lot of work to mm-hmm. get that uniform. And sure. so when you first get on as a ranger, it's almost like this uniform is the beginning of an adventure. But that's sort of similar to, to basic training. Uh, what was it like in the military for you? What was that experience like for you? So I did six years active duty in the Air Force. Um, My career field was security forces, which is, it translates to the Marine Corps, Army, MPs. And so we did a lot of law enforcement, a lot of security. Um, I was stationed three years in New Mexico. And then the other three years was just abroad, traveling through the U.S. and then overseas. Uh, Did a tour in Iraq for a year, special duty, doing police convoy mission over there in 2008. And um, I did it seven months out in the Caribbean, doing a lot of uh, warfare on drugs. Sorry, Nat was in my eye. Um, 
but I mean, that was a really great experience and I can go further into it if you'd like. Okay. We had a, uh, we had an indoor plan for the podcast, but Jeremy said Rangers are outside. So he is. That's right. Eyes. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I want it. That's real. So, good. So you drove to Nashville, you met our chief yesterday. How was that? How was that experience? Just driving out and meeting new people. What was that about? Uh, chief Petty, he's really cool. Um, a very down to earth fella and he, you can just tell he has a lot of experience under his belt and he's seen a lot and he's done a lot. It's really nice and refreshing seeing my leadership not just here at the local park but also around the region, around the state and just seeing who our chief ranger is. It's like, ah, I can trust that leadership. Um, I, so I, I went to Nashville the other day to his park. Henry Horton, and I got issued the Nash, or I'm sorry, I didn't get issued Nashville, but I got issued the the clothing that I'm wearing, the uniform, and so I'm excited to pick up. Um, I'm excited to wear it, of course, but it's uh, it's up to date tactical clothing, which is really night and day difference compared to what I was wearing with the Corps. So, so you work for the Corps of Engineers as well. Where was that at? That was in Stockton Lake in Missouri. It's a Kansas City district. Um, we had about 63,000 acres, including the lake, the water reservoir that we patrol and uh, we're responsible for. But um, I, could, I could contrast the night and day difference if you want or yeah, man, just leave it. Just, 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 just go yeah. Um, I was talking to one of my buddies back home in Florida about the different pathways for rangering, um, whether if it's with national parks or with the Corps of Engineers or if you're looking for whatever state you're in, and specifically Tennessee. Um, I was able to find out that they wanted a four-year degree, and that's a qualification I had. Um, with the Corps of Engineers, they wanted a four-year degree within environmental science or natural resources. And that's something that I didn't possess. Um, my bachelor's was in counseling and then a master's was in ministry and organization. And so with my prior law enforcement experience within the military, that I think gave me um, a little bit of advancement when it came time to the hiring process. And Angela would know more about that, but um, the, I guess the job duties in light of visitor assistance and recreation um, within that field are similar for a core ranger in comparison to a Tennessee state park ranger. And um, there's just a lot more natural resources, um, responsibilities that you would do with the core of engineers uh, in comparison to my specific role here um, with the Hawassi Koei. And I think that will definitely vary depending on your management and type of park you're in. It just, uh, it depends where you're going to be, but I could sit here and talk to you about the differences between the Corps engineers, which was only just a summer that I served there, six months, um, compared to what I'm seeing right now as a fresh and very green ranger for Tennessee State Parks. I think that, um, I think this is almost like, um, there are jobs and there are careers. I think that when you find a career, it's almost like finding a mate. Um, I, I told you that when I put this uniform on, it crossed my mind that this might be the last uniform I ever wear as an employee before I retire. Like I yeah. made, this might be the only uniform I ever put on and suit up until the day I leave the workforce. And for me, it's like a, it's like a relationship, and I think that you could probably feel the same way with your wife, or you just married. Is that it almost feels unearned in a lot of ways? Like, it's um, a good way to put it. Yeah. Like, here I am. I don't know how I got here, uh, but I want to make sure that I earn the privilege of being beside this woman every day for the rest of my life, and I think that that's the same pressure that you feel as a ranger is that, you know, I'm just getting into this thing, but I want to make sure that I do this uniform justice for all the other people and all the, all the efforts and. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that, um, I think that that's kind of like the thing that a lot of people don't understand about 
the Rangers in the uniform is that you do almost have imposter syndrome a little bit where you feel like, I can't believe I get a paycheck. For the, you haven't gotten a paycheck yet. But when you get one, it'll one be day. Like, wow, look at this. I'm getting paid. He's literally had this uniform on today. Like he yeah. got to try it on yesterday, and this is his first day. What do you think are going to be some of your most rewarding moments this year? I can think of three of the most prior rewarding, and the first one comes very natural, and that's just being within the campgrounds or being on a trail or leading some sort of program where I get to see possibly a memory being created amongst a family member, a father and son or daughter or something of that nature. That, that always tugs at my heart, um, just seeing that kindled. Um, Another thing would probably be if I get to be a participant in some sort of rescue scenario, knowing that I had, a, had an effort of preventing a rescue or actually making a rescue take place, um, being part of that party would be very rewarding. Um, I think it's going to be rewarding understanding the job more and applying things. I'm sure it's going to be incredibly rewarding when I get through the academy because that's going to be a couple months of fun or a few months of fun. Um, but really, I think the whole thing's rewarding, just being able to be here. And what, do you, uh, what do you anticipate being some of your biggest challenges? Uh, the initial learning curve getting the groove of things, seeing how the Rangers operate, seeing what management wants from me, um, understanding what my individual performance plan will be. And so once I know that, we'll have more of a criteria to um, judge my performance off of. But um, I think that'd probably be it, Angela. All right. A special thing about Jeremy is he's hiked the Appalachian Trail. He did some good media documentation of that. None that I've seen, but he's talked about oh, yeah? it a lot. And so uh, we may see a lot of his uh, addition to our, our media, but what made you decide to hike the Appalachian Trail? What made you go through with it? What, what were some moments of, what, I mean, what yeah. was that like? That's a great question. Um, so at around 2017, I was at a pretty big crossroads in my life where I just had a marriage end and I was moving out of state and so I found myself at a crossroads in between jobs, relationships and just life and usually as a 34 or 33 year old fella those opportunities are not given to you very often in life. You know, you usually have kids or some sort of career that's holding you and keeping you grounded. And so I saw that there is an opportunity to take that. And I learned about the trail back in 2013, the AT. Hiked a little bit of it when I went through grad school. And I just fell in love with the romantic idea of like, wait, you get to hike through not just one, but 14 states. And you get to experience, uh, the rich areas of all around our nation and learn the back the back country areas learn about the people and the history the culture there's just so much tied into this trail um, where still it's there for you to take one step at a time so nobody was paying me to do it or anything like that is just a a motive of telling myself hey i want to do this and i do not want to quit and I was willing to sacrifice and do whatever it takes to get me there. And so um, snow, rain, mud, injuries, blisters, you know, you would be faced with those sort of things. Um, but I'm grateful to not have any of those factors really come into play. I had an injury um, that took me off the trail for about a week. But uh, I learned a lot and the trail taught me so much. And I have so many lifelong friends and my family, my trail family that uh, I got to meet um, throughout that hike. But yeah, it's, it's changed me and it's shaped me. And so I knew that that's the sort of challenge that I needed when, um, before I was going out on the trail and I needed to push myself and, and make it happen. So a cool trail name? Yeah, I have On Step is the trail name. On Step, okay. I got, I got yeah. that from my mama. But um, On Step, yeah, 2018. Did you read any books to prepare for this or did you just 
like did you have care packages dropped off? I mean, how does that work? How does one just, I know what the trail is. Yes, sir. To wrap my head around planning a five month and seven day. Yes, sir. Trip. Yes, sir. Which would be, you know, that's a long. It's about half a year. Um, so as a traditional hiker where you hike from the south heading up north, they call it chasing spring. And uh, the, the final terminus, the northern terminus at Mount Katahdin, they shut down that park, Baxter State Park in October. So you have a little bit of a time frame where you're like, all right, mid-October, I don't even know if I can do this final summit because things will be closed. Um, so I wanted to take my time and I took my time and I got my trail legs after about a month. And so I went from hiking eight to 12 miles a day up to 20 and eventually uh, did a couple 30s but uh, to answer your question on prepping i was living in indiana and um is in the winter when i started to prepare i had about six months gear preparation was a huge thing of like all right what's the best brands um, as well as a little bit of physical preparation and so the only thing i had really in indiana since we don't have a lot of mountains there is uh, the Stairmaster at the local Planet Fitness. And so I'd do that with a pack on and just try working my, my lower body and strengthening my back a little bit. Um, but I did read a couple books. Um, Appalachian Trials was a really good one. Not Appalachian Trails, but it was a good. There's several good ones. That's um, what they did there. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, lots of YouTube videos, lots of uh, podcasts. And I could give you a list. I could write down a list if you wanted to refer this later. But um, that was pretty much it. So no care packages. Um, actually, I did have my father. He sent out three different. No, just one different shoe to me. Um, I went through four pairs of shoes, and uh, I want to say I had a total two care packages sent to me. Some people they have a every hundred miles they get a care package and it has your food and everything but I had enough guidance where I didn't need that and also funds you have a you have to have a lot of funds to get a lot of care packages too and so mine was budget friendly it was about four thousand dollars altogether with plane rides and gear and whatnot so it's not bad so no talk about gear research do you believe that like you have to have the highest end gear or did you find some shortcuts and things along the way that were effective? That's a great question. Uh, Angela, I think um, if you're willing, you can have all gear from Walmart, you know what I mean? Um, or issue gear. Like I learned one thing with the military is a lot that they issued isn't very ultralight at all. It's very, it's usually very um, sturdy and it can endure a lot, but there's a lot of weight penalty that happens to that. But um, I've seen folks with Ozark trail tents, you know, that you can get at Walmart where they're four or five pounds. And I've seen people with just a tarp where it's so ultra light and it's 10 ounces, you know. Um, for me, I had a mixture. I try leaning towards the big three, which is your shelter, your sleep system and your pack, um, which would I, I would try to shave as much weight as possible with those. And so I did pay for some premium ultra light gear there to save on weight. Um, but you learn as you're humping those miles, as you're hiking, uh, what works and what doesn't. And, um, there's some great things that are heavy and luxurious uh, that you can take along with you. You just have to ask yourself, how much are you willing to count the cost or sacrifice to get to your destination? And for me, I wanted my hike to be as easy as possible. Um, and as less strain as possible and enjoyable. And so often when you're taking those factors into consideration, you're looking into more of the ultralight stuff. And so uh, I think I spent about a thousand dollars altogether in gear. So you're less concerned with the, uh, the comfort of your after trail, but more concerned with your daily in and out comfort. Is that the kind of what you put an emphasis on? Yes, sir. That would, yeah. I read a uh, read a book about the Ghost Mountain Boys, and it was about uh, World War II and these National Guardsmen that got activated to go fight on this island uh, back in you know when they were when we were fighting Japan. But one of the things they talked about was the trail of just 
detritus of American soldiers because they mm. had toilet seats that were issued just to carry around for in the woods. They had all this gear and they very quickly realized like, this is I'm junk. not carrying this. And yeah. So they just shed so much stuff. And they said that the like tribesmen on those islands would just follow them with like all these treasures that they were yeah. moving around. So what was, was there anything in particular for you that you thought, I'm going to need this. And then you're like, I do not need this. Any, any particular item that you. It's somewhat, um, we have these things on the trail called gear shakedowns and, or a pack shakedown. And I had a previous hiker who hiked the trail, I want to say in 2016, smoke break, that was his name. And, uh, I went to high school with him and I learned like he knocked out the trail. So I said, Hey, could you give me a gear shakedown? And with the, sort of information that I came across, I knew that I had a couple luxury items. Um, and so I removed them from my pack before he was able to even see what I had. Um, but there is a couple like an umbrella. I kept the umbrella the whole time um, because it's great not having to have rain hit you in your face, you know what I mean? Or to shield you from the sun when you're above tree line. It had its, uh, or shield you from the wind. It had its benefits, and so I ca carried this umbrella for a while. Um, but the initial thing that I that I took away, um, that I removed, was a a massager. It's a little roller, kind of like you would roll out a cookie dough or something like that. I'm trying to think of the actual name. I think it's a tiger a tiger claw or something like that. Nonetheless. I removed that after a couple weeks because it's dead weight, but it's great to massage your muscles at the end of the day. And so I'd pass it around with myself and other hikers and you just roll out whatever injuries you had um, because the quicker you get your muscles recover, I'm sorry, the quicker you massage them, the better your recovery, your recovery will be. Um, I think it's called Tiger Paul. I can't think of what it is. What was there anything that you found more important that you like particularly became attached to that you didn't expect? Like an item that you thought this isn't and then you're like, oh man, I'm so glad I brought this. Maybe a knife. Um, my brother, he he made a knife for me. Um, so it was a handmade knife, it was a fixed blade knife from Rotten Design. And um, I didn't think I'd use it as often as I did, but uh, I did use it just about daily from shaving down a tent steak um, to doing meal preps and stuff like that. There was a couple times where there was a bear right next to me and I got bluff charged once. And so I, I'd use it as a defensive weapon if I had to, too. And so it was something that was comforting, that was very practical. And um, yeah, that'd just be used daily, having a, a good fixed blade out there. Yeah. That's, uh, that was my experience with my knife over in Iraq, too. I remember picking one up, and then I remember feeling stupid about it. Like, what am I, I going to do with this? And yeah. I use it so often for so many little things that I never even thought I would use it for. It was the same kind of, you know, you just go, huh. Absolutely. I understand now why it's the old man code to always have a pocket knife. You know, it's just one of those things that you kind of go, that's why they do that. All yeah. Right, you know. A man without a knife is a man without a life. I've heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I can. I can. Are you, um, did you grow up outdoorsy? Did you grow up uh, just father? I mean, what, that's what a great, did you have? that's another one. Um, so in Florida, our first property that I remember living in didn't have much land or anything. But then uh, when I was age 12, we moved along a river and down by the river. But uh, we moved at the river and called Pond Creek there in Milton, Florida. And it would take me to a larger river up to the bay and that would take me to the Gulf. And so I spent countless hours out on the river kayaking and just exploring and learning the history of my town and what was this old sandbar used for uh, back in the day. But um, my father, he would take me out and scouts. So I was with Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and he would come along on different uh, outings or events. And so I had him as kind of an outdoorsy figure, but also my best friend growing up, 
um, his father owned a park called Adventures Limited, and so we'd always goof around in the woods. And the majority of my time as a, as a kid, if it wasn't raining, um, was completely outdoors, building tree houses and just playing soldier, um, playing Indiana Jones, you know, or Jurassic Park. I'd look for fossils. I thought I'd be a paleontologist, archaeologist, like, you know, I think the cool thing about the outdoors is that for a kid, your mind can just go wild and there's no better place for a kid than being outside so you can go wild. Um, but my parents gave me a lot of trust, I think, when I was around 14 years of age, roughly 13, where I'd just kayak and go sleep on different sandbars up on the river. And um, I think they knew that I had a little bit of responsibleness to me and they could trust me um, that I'd be safe out in the woods and try making uh, good decisions for sure. I think that's changed a lot. I think that when you and I were both young, there was that freedom that you got at 14, mm -hmm. 13, 14. A lot of the local guys here talk about being 14 and just riding their dirt bikes back in the woods when they were allowed to do that. Yeah. And then yeah. we'd be gone for days. Our parents just pre cell phone. I think it's interesting that like- Yeah, that's a day, good point. No cell phone. We, I didn't have a cell phone back then either. We huh. have so much communication. We have more communication now and yet we have lost the, uh, it seems to me like we've lost the, free, our kids have lost the freedom to go about like we like we used to i don't yeah i think that probably stunts a lot of growth you know a natural exploration where it's there's so many lessons that the nature can teach us and so many things we can discover about ourselves and work on different confidence and stuff of just going outside and exploring and i think sometimes the phone in our hands or the media device is definitely hindering it. I'm sure you could do a whole podcast on all that. Yeah, I think we could get into that. Um, yeah. Both of us being fathers, that's a line that I walk a lot because you invest in your children. You want to have them around forever. You want them to grow. But on the other end, you realize that if I don't let them take a risk or two here and there, yeah, they're never really going to grow Yeah, because they won't be able i can't they won't be able to make those decisions on their own if they don't get the practice of making decisions on their own when there's a low cost yeah yeah growth often requires risk you know i hear you i think that's one of the biggest gifts of the outdoors it's just that yeah climb up there i don't i don't know you know i'm gonna jump off this all right well just see what happens yeah yeah i think yeah. That that's important um so with mm -hmm. your father and being involved in scouts, did you go to Eagle Scout? Did you, like, how far did you get in No, I want to say I got all the way up to second class. And so it's funny looking back, um, something that my father and I have talked about is that with different programs in life, especially as a youth, he wished that he would have enforced saying, if Jeremy was to sign up for this event, then Jeremy needs to stick it out to the end. And so Boy Scouts is something that I didn't go all the way through. Um, and I think my motives was that we played football too often and it was just getting boring. Yeah. And so that's how I was thinking when I was a 15, 14 year old pup, mm -hmm. you know? Well, Scouts is a tough thing because it's not like a season. Like I'm gonna start scouting. It's like, this is a decade, you know? Yeah, so it yeah. is a different, that, I think that is, a, it's a harder thing to get kids to stick through, especially when sports get involved that's a big drop off right there so you played organized sports what do you think is the the main like difference being an athlete in rewards because you're outdoors playing sports you're physical what's the difference between like outdoor unrestricted play versus sporting um probably i think a lot of when we talk about sporting the team sports always comes to mind rather than the individual sport. But when I think of outdoor play, I'm thinking more of an individual sport of like, all right, today outdoor play for me is going on a eight mile hike or something like that. Um, in comparison to an individual sport, are you going against others? It's just a different, it's a different idea, Angelo. Um, 
when when you come down to sport because I think when you say sport it's more competition against other folks um, compared to outdoor play where that's usually single and um, I feel that probably outdoor play you're gonna have a lot more enjoyment perhaps and less pressures compared to just um, whatever sports scenario you'd be referencing yeah I don't know that's well, just my I, thought on I, that I grew up outdoors all the time in the inner city and so Mm. When when I was raised, we played a lot of sports. I mean, it was baseball, soccer, football. You know, if there was some kind of sport going on, it was like Dad had me out there sports, and you know that was just that was just that was how he was raised. He just didn't know any different, and I, I got a lot of rewards from that. Yeah. But it was when I found the outdoors, those little wild spaces in between the buildings, mm. that like. It was like my imagination opened up. We, uh, I remember my friends and I used to walk to the mall, but we found there was like a, probably a seven acre lot through the woods. Yeah. You could take versus the road. That was your candy it land. It took longer, but at the, in our time we were just, a, what if we came out and it was like we'd walk through like a time portal in this like hundred years ago yeah. or a hundred years in the future. What if we've been missing and everybody's old and, it was like you, your brain was able to have these big adventures. Yeah, yeah. There's so much more imagination, enrichment, and nourishment that comes into play in comparison to, all right, we're going to go to this gymnasium and dribble a ball or throw a ball. You know, um, they both have development, but I'd be curious to learn, like, what's the best development you can put a little child into or kid, you know? Yeah. Hmm. I just wish there had been... My father just didn't know, but people watching this podcast, uh, that's one of the things I think it'd be great if we could get, encourage people to do is come out and see us because I think that we need to make it in our schedule to make room mm -hmm. for that, for that wide open spaces, for those yeah. wild spaces. Absolutely. Like, um, that's something that I'd love to see is the adventure packages, exposure packages, packages, and, uh, ultimately therapy, um, that nature can provide for us. I think we have a lot of, uh, frontier before us to travel on, you know, to pioneer. I think so too. So, okay. So that's a question. So you're new to Polk County. I don't remember not knowing where everything is. Um, eh, the lay of the land. I remember... <laughs> realizing that people who'd grown up here had a hard time understanding that I didn't know where everything was. Um, just, you don't know where this is? You know, like, no, I've never, I don't know. I've never heard of this. Um, yeah. So you've traveled a lot, you've been places. What are some things that you think we can do to help facilitate when people get boots on ground where they're oriented? You know, like you're, you've kind of wandered around a little bit, started to familiarize yourself. What are some things that you think that, that we lack in this area? Man. We know all the resources are there. We know that. Rock climbing, mountain biking, paddling, hiking, right. camping. Well, I think um, at least park wise, what we have is our visitor, uh, visitor center. And that's where you can register campsites and stuff. And it's really, I think, Becky and Carrie's role. It's so vital of kind of like analyzing and assessing the person of like, all right, are you looking for anything more than just a campsite? Because if so, then we're going to be able to help you out that or help you in that area. And that's what we want to do. Um, I know that there's different map layouts that are out there that shows you geographically where you're at and gives you a lay of land. Um, but I'd be interested in discovering and learning more ideas of how can we disclose some of the gyms and entry experiences that this park has to offer in Cherokee National Forest, you know? Yeah. It's a great, I think our programs, um, that we're listing on Facebook will obviously, I'm sorry, no, we just list on, we list them on Facebook and on the Tennessee website. They kind of get information out there, but there's a lot of opportunities, like something I'm gonna do as a ranger, as when I tour around, whether they're on the Okoe or here at the G Creek campground, is I'm gonna try making contacts with folks and seeing what they're interested in and tell them 
about different uh, the different areas or what we got coming up in light of what they're looking for or what we can expose them to because I think you can you know I think you and I will both be lifelong learners of the nature before us and it just offers so much whether if you're into getting engaged with high recreation activities whitewater rafting to backpacking and climbing different mountains and trying to do that timed um, or if you're just looking at um, I don't know where I was going with that uh, I was thinking of the high-end type stuff to more of just yeah just riding around and looking at pretty scenery well that yeah that I mean, too that's that's the low end. just I mean you can go from as high and dangerous and a week out in the woods as, as just simply pulling up and day you know taking a picnic for the day mm -hmm. I think that trying to make sure that people know a what's there but b how to get to it absolutely yeah I think is a, is a big thing that we sure do. I was talking to you yesterday about how I, I remember when I went to Alaska that state is gigantic and yet when you got there you kind of had like just from the airport on, they do, they did a great job as a state understanding that there's going to be a lot of tourism here. You want to go see the seals? Go this way. You want to go see this? Go that way. You yeah, know, it, was just, yeah. it just kind of felt like you were getting, you know, it was very easy to fall into those slots of like, this is what we're doing. Okay, we're all heading that way. It was just, I'd like to, I'd like to streamline that. For sure. In a lot of ways. Um, I think that, uh, I think that'd be right up your alley being new. Mm -hmm. You can kind of work with that experience of like, okay, well, no one knows where this is. So when you say if they get here, you know, well, we got to get them there easier. I think that'll be a, a big benefit. For um, sure. What do you think the river is going to be like? What do you think? Uh, what do you think it's going to be like over on the Okoe? I was going to say Hawassi is probably going to be pretty consistent, but the Okoe uh, will probably be a madhouse. Um, right now, I kind of have time before season, so preseason, to kind of get familiar and acquainted with things. But I think um, we're gonna have congested traffic. We'll probably have lots of different rescues. Um, just a lot of chaos over there, but a lot of fun and changing of environment where hopefully um, there'll be different things that we'll get to deal with as rangers and as maintenance folks here at the park um, to help folks get the most out of their experience, out of their adventure while they're out on the Koei. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to even, it's hard to wrap your head around it. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. I, uh, I think you're really going to enjoy it. I think that it's going to be a really amazing experience. I think that it's kind of like when you do missionary work. Uh, I don't know if you've experienced this, but when I did missionary work, it was almost like I felt like I was getting more out of the experience than I was giving. You know, that's true. you go to these yeah. people and you're like trying to help them and you're learning all this cool stuff and you're exposed to this life changing like view and you go come back like, I think I got more out of it than, than they got out of me. I don't know. That's I, true. I think that the Okoe will be that way where you will share as much as you can share and try to help as much as you can help. But the people that you meet mm -hmm. and the things that you see will benefit you so much that you'll come away a different person with a different perspective. Um, it's almost like uh, you'll see when spring gets here, it's almost like when the first of the year started in school and everybody talks about where they went all summer. It's kind of like that. Everybody's been gone on trips all winter out to ski resorts or whatever. So everybody's meeting back. Like, What'd you do? What'd you do over the break? Oh, I did this and that. I think it'll be, it's really fascinating how I'm sure far everybody travels and where they come from and what they yeah. get into so yeah i'm excited to see that see what things will be like a year out from now being like oh man i was ignorant on this or actually had a, an idea of what i was stepping into for sure yeah so are you going to try kayaking this year you gonna try to get into that oh everything yeah um i've done a little bit of rafting out in colorado before but uh, i've yet to raft in the southeast um I remember my buddy when I was probably about 10, 
Uh, his father was a really big kayaker. He's been whitewater kayaking, and uh, they were showing me how Eskimo roll in it when I was a you know a little kid. And I was like, "What? You got to be in water to learn how to flip yourself back up? Why not just swim away?" You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the whole idea of oh, we got a hiker coming. But the whole idea of uh, learning how to whitewater kayak and trying to gain that skill really excites me. It's way harder than it looks. Yeah. Oh yeah, I bet. I bet. You want to take us, buddy? All right. So we had a little pause because we had some hikers coming through. Um, what in the process of that, Jeremy brought up uh, an interesting point. One of my biggest issues as a father is that I'm not very good at taking that time for me to have my adventures. Um, mm. uh, especially being a single dad is particularly challenging. I have motorcycles that I like to ride that I rarely ride and I'll just look at them in the basement and think one day um, I'm not I, I want to be with my children all the time um, I feel like I miss something every day and I'm sure you're the same way um, so what was that like being a father with young children and, and making this journey and how yeah. did that effect was that did that how did that affect your decision to make the journey how i mean what went yeah. into that and so um in 2018 the spring in march that's when i started the trail and before then i've had multiple conversations with my ex-spouse and we both felt like the most healthiest thing i could do as an individual would be to remove myself as a parent, um, because I was a single parent as well trying to do that. Um, she had full custody. I did not just because there's so many lack of resources and just everything you need to try sharing kids. It just wasn't there at the time for myself. And here I am at a dark journey in my life in 2016 and 17. Um, we both came to the realization that I needed to do the trail. It'd be the best thing for me, but how can I still see my kids in between? And so that's something when I was vlogging it, people asked the questions of like, hey, aren't you a dad? How can you still see your kids? What does that look like? Because here it is a half a year commitment, you know, hiking through the Appalachian Mountains. Um, Marco Polo was an app we used often, sending videos to the kids um, back and forth. What they knew, so I had three, I have three kids. And at the time, they were both two-year-olds and a five-year-old, um, a little younger than that. But uh, I would send them videos. We would uh, do online videos as well where we could interact. And all they knew is that dad was doing a long walk in the woods. And that's basically the way we would share with them um, in a way that they could understand it and that dad was trying to get healthy. Um, there's twice in two different states, once in North Carolina and then once out in Maryland. Um, that the kids actually got to come out and I got off the trail for a couple of days and I get to hang out with them and they grew, they'd feel my beard and see whatever little hiker muscles I had going on and we just have a good time and it's very nourishing um, to take that on but another reason why I did that hike was to leave the legacy behind saying you know we can do hard things and um, part of that sacrifice was me not being very present in their life um, so I could get the nourishment that I needed. I think uh, before you, I mean, just as a ranger um, and as the guy standing before you right now or sitting, for me to be nourishing to the folks that I get to work with, I first have to be nourished. And so you have to be a little bit selfish and take that time for you. Um, but in, in the return, hopefully you'll be all the more healthy to give. It's a tough line. It is, it's yeah. Tough line it's something that evolves um, I think with time and it looks different in different environments and situations that you find yourself in it's like all right well what's the best you know that you can do with what you're given I had a friend tell me one time you need a guy's night out and I was like I had a guy's night out the entire time I was in the military I don't need mm. any more guys nights out but on the other end you do realize that it it's just as much healthy for you to get out and do something that you enjoy. Yeah, you're exactly right. Because 
when people camp, I see a lot of times there's a lot of stress involved. And the reason why that stress is involved is people have like predisposed, like, like in their mind, like this is how it's supposed to be. And they can't get the fire started. And by the time it's time for s'mores, the kids are tired and the, you know, what advice can you give people that take families and come and go camping and go outdoors? What, what advice can you give on that? Like, whether if you're on a through hike or um, if you're going to be camping in a campground where there's multiple campers around you, um, one would be just getting familiar with your gear, uh, having an understanding. And so that's one thing we want to do as rangers is just help prepare people for that, whether if it's offering a program of the introduction to camping, what does that look like? Um, what do you need? Um, I'd also say for folks to be open to advice and insight because sometimes we get in this zone the state of mind that i can figure it out or i can do it on my own when one of the things that the trails taught me is that you need to be open to advice or help from other people and um, a lot that got me through the trail was hitchhiking going into town you know whatever it was um, i had to rely a lot on other people and so i think the community at large um, within campgrounds people really enjoy it and so hopefully other campers can see that this guy needs help setting up his tent or he's starting to shout and uh, you can see things escalating if if you would have that state of mind saying hey i don't know everything there is about camping or i need to talk to somebody more skilled you know there's a lot of i think opportunities right next next to where you're camping or with us rangers you know that's something i truly delight in is teaching somebody how to set up a tent or how to kind of hang up their hammock properly where they're going to get the best fit you know at night and not be so restless um it's just uh, i think an ongoing state of mind of wanting to learn and uh, being humble enough to take that sort of advice or insight um, of course youtube's a huge educator as well yeah. of like how to do this, you know. I just remember the first time I took the kids, my kid's pretty tough kid in general. He was four. And I remember him crying incessantly at like eight o'clock. Uh, and I was like, what are you doing? And then I realized the minute we pulled up, there were kids here. He is running that playground all day, did not take a nap. Ooh. You know, he's just been crazy. So by the time eight o'clock came around, all that simulation and all yeah. these, it was just like, he just crashed, but it, it, I just, you know, it was just such a different schedule that I hadn't anticipated how taxing that would be. I've never even thought about naps, you know, for the little kids who need naps, like, are they going to get a nap in a tent or where are they going to, you know yeah, what I mean? Like keeping that on schedule and time. That's a, I never yeah. even thought about that. You think about that and then you go, oh, oh. That's yeah, it. yeah. So there isn't such a thing as too much fun, apparently, but. You know, mm. um, what are you uh, looking forward that you've learned in life? Um, everybody, the, the ranger field is so, such a broad spectrum that everybody brings tools. Um, I was a high adventure guy before I got here. So the rock mm -hmm. climbing, the, you know, that stuff was kind of down my alley. But then when you got to the minutia of like, plant names and it, it, i just wasn't very good at that i've gotten better but what are you that you know you've done a lot of things what are you most exciting about being able to teach and bring to bring to the game i'd be very excited to, to teach my natural interest um, and some of them have a lot of knowledge behind them and some don't like what you're saying plant identification you know i'd love to learn more about the wild edibles medicinal plants and stuff like that the just a weed you know what i mean what are the benefits of this um i'm wanting to learn more of that but naturally my state of mind goes to i'd love to bring this park as the gateway for folks the gateway to their adventure to their leisure of all right you're into reading on a hammock, let's make that happen. We have this certain site next to the river. If you're into meditation, we have this really cool area, you know, where you're gonna hear a waterfall or the water flow. It's moving, isn't it? Yeah, My it's bad. The wind. Um, really landing in those things that are the most nourishing to me, you know. Well, I mean, I know you've got 
backpacking skills. What did you eat on the trail? Um, that's a huge thing that we, I deal with when I look at multiple night trips. There you go. Yeah. What am I going to eat? Like how, how much time do I need to take to making a meal? Yeah. Um, at the end of the day when you're pooped, it's like, do you really want to stay up 30 minutes doing a meal prep or is it something quick and easy, right. but still the nutrition? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you have a lot to bring to the table for that. I think you could probably teach oh, absolutely. classes. We can maybe have some monthly cook-offs, backpack cook-offs where everybody leaves with a recipe. I think that'd be really fun. Do uh, some ramen bombs. Yeah. Everything always boils down to ramen, but yeah. <laughs> Doesn't it though? College, camping. It does, it ramen. does. Um, what do you, uh, what are you hoping to plug into in our area? What's something that you're, you, you mentioned all your interests. What is, what is something that you had in your previous social realm that you're looking to try to find here plug into here i think community um a lot of my backing within faith and also into the degrees it has a lot to do with uh, community i think we're at our most when we're not necessarily isolated isolation has its own place for different purposes and seasons but um i'm really eager to get established within the community to see how i'm able to help um, what are the needs of the community? Can the park provide that? Can I provide that as an individual? Um, because at the end of the day, nature, I think, will always regrow itself and heal itself. And so I don't see nature really perishing, even though we may be really harsh to the environment around us. And maybe there's future devastation to happen, but I think out of chaos, order will come within nature. But the biggest value, I think, is you and I and the, the people around us of what is the legacy I want to leave? Of course, I want to protect and preserve these forests, but I also want to experience life with other people and see them find joy. I think um, one of the biggest quotes out there is happiness is real when shared, you know, and I think we can find that when we're engaged in community of however you see that. Um, and so just learning where I fit in that and my wife and when my kids come back, well, what they'll look like. My kids are in England for the next like two and a half years. Um, they're over there serving in the Air Force. Not the kids, but the ex-wife and her husband. It's, it's hard on them. It's yeah, hard to yeah. Up to everybody's... It's great. They get to see a lot of Europe already. And so hopefully that'll help uh, enrich them as little ones and something that they hopefully will be able to remember being like oh yeah you remember this over there in the uk um that is a thing though people don't always anticipate i didn't know when i joined the army that my family was joining the army yeah yeah you yeah know, um it's something to think about with our veterans um, it's something to think about with our active duty folks is that your ex-wife being in the service means your children are sort of in the service because they're in Europe, they're wherever mom and dad have to go, mom and stepdad, which means you're also, there's just a, the serve, it's a, it's a, serving is a, it has a lot of echoes in, in big yeah. ways, negative ways, it's just something to really think about the power of that word service. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of sacrifice, you know. On the other end, I think that every time we help somebody, that also creates that wave that continues to go out in all directions. Absolutely. You know, so there's yeah. sacrifice, there is a cost, but the net gains there it's huge. are huge. Absolutely, absolutely.